Come on in, Facebook. Come on in. 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 This is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you, my Facebook family. Thank God for you, you and you. Let me open up and get me some air today. Amen. Let's thank God for his goodness and for his mercy. You out there all over the world that watch us every Wednesday at 2 o'clock from 2 to 3 this hour. We're grateful for what God is doing in the land and what God is doing in our ministry. Continue to keep us in prayer in our ministries as we continue to serve in the kingdom. We are grateful for all of you that uh, watches us every Wednesday at this hour. Those of you that are watching us live, we praise God for you. Those of you that are watching the Brinson Connection by another time of day or another day, uh, we thank God for you. Those of, uh, of you that are watching us by YouTube or our YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe before you leave the channel. Amen. We thank God for his goodness. Why don't you right now just hit your share button, hit your share button, hit your share button and share with one of your friends that Dr. Brinson is on the air. We thank God. So those of you that are coming on Bishop Stern, God bless you. We just ask you to hit your share button, hit your share button, share now. We are grateful for what God has been doing and let the Redeemer of the Lord say so. Well, every Wednesday at two o'clock from two to three, we've been coming on for a while. Those of you that want to get some of our teachings, go to our YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Sylvester Paul Brinson III. We have over 150 teachings on that channel, on our channel. I hope that there's something that we have said or taught that will help you, motivate you, and inspire you as you continue to do what God has called you to do. Well, as we, as usual, we come on and we teach the Sunday school lesson uh, as uh, put out by the International Sunday School Lesson. And every Wednesday, we teach and talk about and explain the lesson with contemporary analysis and dealing with the different uh, modalities that we find in the text. And uh, our Sunday school lesson for this coming Sunday is going to be about Jonah. We are entering, this is the last Sunday of our quarter. And for the whole quarter, the Sunday school lesson has been around the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. God's call on their life, called them to preach, to be prophets, to proclaim his word to the people, the children of Israel, and also to the nations. And so we thank God. I have been inspired just for the last quarter, these three months teaching from the various prophets and uh, we uh, had a great time as I go back and reflection and look at some of the prophets that uh, we taught on. And, and it's just been very exciting uh, to talk about the various prophets and uh, those that uh, challenged us. And out of that listening and, and watching and studying, we can find how God wants to use us. Well, today, uh, uh, if you got your Bibles, uh, the lesson comes from Jonah, the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah. My, I taught the lesson this morning, every Wednesday, for those who are not busy, you can go on our uh, page, Facebook page, and look at the flyer. We have a conference call line for every Wednesday morning from 1030 to 12, and we uh, talk about the Sunday school lesson from the commentaries. And we have a great group of people who tune in to us and talk and we share and dialogue and have great times. There was great insights today on this lesson. And so I want to share with you and also those, uh, all of our international brothers and sisters, God bless you. God bless you. All of you that comes on, those who inbox me, those who give and support the ministry, want to know more about our ministry, go to our website, look at our website page, www.thebrinsoninstitute.com, www.thebrinsoninstitute.com, thebrinsoninstitute.com. And go on there and look at our various ministries 
and what we're doing. Well, Jonah, the fiery preacher, Jonah, chapter 3, chapter 3, chapter 3, or just look at the whole book of Jonah, chapter 3, but we start off with chapter 3. I want to read it. Let me read the, let me read the portion of chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 9. And uh, to set the stage for those of you, um, chapters one, chapter three, verses one through ten, so you get an idea of the lesson today we want to talk about. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went into Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days journey. I mean, it took three days to get through the city of Nineveh and its suburbs, the suburbs, the towns. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days. And Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published to Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God, Yea. Let him turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works and they, and they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. All right, this is our text for the day. Uh, Bishop Stern, uh, Sister Linda Johnson, all the rest watching. So now, what challenges me as I begin to look at this? First of all, in our text, it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. He had a second chance. How many of you God has talking to for the second time, after he had to deal with you. See, God God never begs you to do anything for him, but he sets up situations and, and experiences in your life that if you are called and set aside for his glory, you just can't get away. You, you, you just can't get away. God's going to come back. My word will not return unto me void. One of the things that I really uh, thought about and it really challenged me as I was looking at the text and reading the commentaries. There were some things that stood out to me that was very clear that God uh, will always challenge you. You cannot get away from God. No matter what you think you might do, no matter how you feel, you must learn how to obey God. And so that was really challenged Challenge me out and was looking at my commentaries because I don't want to plagiarize anything, but I was reading from the commentaries. We have three different commentaries and that um, we were sharing from. And one of the things that was clear was that when God calls you and when God sets you aside, you, you, you can do what you want to do. There's just some things that you have been assigned purpose and destiny have just assigned you. you. You can't get away with it, no matter how you try to get away with it, no matter what you do, what you say, you can try to put it off. But there are just certain things that God calls you to do 
that you just have to know that that you've been called to do it. Listen to what the commentary said. I was looking at it under the application of scripture. One of the things that was so clear to me was that uh, in the commentary, we talked about that God has so called certain people. Jonah, uh, Edward Jones Jr., God, Jonah received a commission. He received a commission. His commission was a divine mission. What you must understand is we talk about purpose and destiny issues. When God calls you and give you a commandment to do something, that's that that comes from him. That's divine. That 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 comes from him. So there were three things that God told uh Jonah to do. And they were they they were uh, imperative commands. He said, "Jonah, I need you to arise." That was one. Go, that was two, and preach. Arise, go, and preach. Arise. Jonah, get up. Get up. Get up from where you are. Get up from where you stay, where you live. Get up. Arise. And then I want you to go somewhere. God will never tell you to get up and not tell you where to go. Notice that. Arise. Huh? Go and preach. Some people get up. God told me to get up. I'm ready to go. Hallelujah. But where you going? I don't know. I'm waiting on the Lord. Wait, 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 wait. God said, arise, go and preach. So Jonah was in this divine commandment on a mission assignment. All mission assignments tell you what to do, how to do it, what to do with what, and where to go, and when you get there, what you're supposed to be representing. So, John, I want you to get up from your country. I want you to go to Nineveh, and your assignment when you get there is to preach. This time. And so, this time, God, Jonah responded and was obedient. But sometimes we must understand that you, you cannot just blatantly disrespect and do what you want to do. And that's what Jonah did. He he said, I want to go. I'm not, no, 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 God. God, no, I, I, I'm not just not going. I, I just, first of all, I don't agree with your assignment. I really, and I'll get up, but I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'll, I'll go to uh, somewhere else. I, I'll go somewhere else away from where I want to go. I'll go in the opposite direction, way, get away from what I'm seeing, get away from my passion. Get away from the presence of the Lord. Get away from my son. You cannot run away, walk away, move away, transfer away from your assignment. That's very important. We must understand that. When God gives you something to do, and he tells you you got to do it, you, you have to learn that you got to obey it. You, you just got to obey what God has told you to do. You cannot get away with it. There is no running away. There is no running away. So God called Jonah and Jonah ran away. Now, God was very patient with Jonah because he could have took him out. So one of the things that I wanted you to know, and right here in the commentary it says, God calls men and women to specific assignments that they cannot elude or escape. There's just some, some assignments that God calls you to. Some of us, God has given us a specific assignment. We can't get away with it or we can't escape it. You just need to know that. Some things, some things, uh, Apostle Battles, God calls us. Some things God gives us a challenge. We can't get away, nor we can't escape. But some of us has the audacity to tell God, you're not going. Let's check on me next time. God said, okay. I'll come to you again, but next time I come to you, you would have had certain kinds of experiences where you are ready now to say, yes, Lord. See, God don't beg you. He don't beg you. But he'll set stages and set you through experiences and allow circumstances to come your way by, by the time you get through going through or he bring you out, you'll be singing that song. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
Have your way. Lord, I'll go. Lord, I'll sing. Oh, 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 you're going to do it if, if you have been given an assignment that is a part of your commission and destiny. So that's what we must be able to determine these things. So as I begin to look at that, Apostle Hardiman and, 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 and Desmond uh, 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 Bishop Stearns, Dr. Jones, I, I begin to understand that it's an urgency that when God calls you and give you an assignment is because he gives it according to your ability. So that this story is almost ties in to the story of the talents. God gives you your assignment according to your ability. He gives you an assignment according to your maturity. He gives you an assignment according to what he has determined that he wants you to do. And so you have to be clear on that. Now, one of the things, you cannot be someone who blatantly refused God's call. I know God called me this and this, but Brinson, heh, that ain't me. Huh. Oh, that ain't you? Well, you better learn how for it. You better begin to learn and study and be open so it becomes you. Sometimes you are challenged to grow and mature to a place that becomes you. Well, that's not me. I was not there. Don't say that's not me. It may not be you. It may not be you, big sister Byrne, baby. No, honey, I don't see it. God didn't ask you whether you saw it or not. He said, arise, go and preach. Three, three commandments to Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh and preach. Well, I, well, well, God told me to rise and go, but he didn't tell me what to do. He didn't tell me what to say. Oh, no, no, no. You, he told you what to say. You just wasn't listening or you heard it, but it didn't, it didn't go through what you was expecting. So you want to play it down. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. You can't play a down. When God gives you a divine commandment, regardless of the situations and circumstances, it means that you need to obey because he's coming back. Well, when he comes back, you would have been through the belly of the fish, the bed of the belly of the fish out of the belly of hell cried. I, I mean, God, do you know God will perform a miracle? He will allow miracles to happen on your behalf to take you out and under just for you. So you can come back when he comes back the second time. Say, I'll be back. Well, God, I'm not going to do that. So, okay. All right. Okay. Enemy, you know, you know, you know, Satan is accused of the brethren. Satan is always on standby. Can I get him, God? Can I get him? Do you, you know, Job, God, God, hey, God, can I have him? Just please let me have him. Please, please God, let me have Brinson. Just uh, give me three days with Brinson. Boy, I beat him, killed his son. I burn down his house. I tap his car. I wreck his church. Just give me three days. I just give me a day. Give me a, a minute. Just give me two minutes. Oh, Satan, the accuser of the brothers, always on standby. You don't never want Satan to get permission from God to go on and do his thing because God is allowing that to happen with you with, uh, within some kind of relationship. Whatever you do, don't kill him. Now, don't kill Brinson now. But whatever you do, just do it, and then I'll be back. Brinson, I want you to do this, 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 and that. I want you, well, you know, I've called and ordained you a prophet. I've called and ordained you an apostle. Well, you know, God, I, I don't want to use the term apostle. Oh, so I gave you a gift. But you don't want to use the terminology of my gift because the situations and the circumstances. Boy, I'm so tired of these folks who call themselves saved and love God. I, I run into people. I say, apostle, so, oh, oh, yeah, I know I'm an apostle. But Brinson, don't say that because, you know, it, 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 it caused me so much conflict. I just want to be sister. Just call me sister. I don't want all these titles. No, you don't want these titles because the title is a summary of your task. Titles are just not out there to be titles. Light say, oh, don't call me light. I just want to shine. I, just let me shine. This, what would I call you that shine? Just, just, just pray for me. No, God, when he ascended, he gave gifts to men and some he gave them to be an apostle, to be a prophet, to be evangelist, to be pastor and teacher. God gave the gift to you to be, and you don't want to become because other folk want you to become in their definition of your be. Don't come trying to define my becoming when you don't understand and won't let me be. So, you know, we got a lot of issues out here and people blatantly disrespecting God and what God wants to do and don't really realize that. 
But God got a fish. He got a special animal. He got a special situation. He got a special circumstance. There are certain circumstances and situations that have come our way that didn't have to. But, 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 but because we were blatantly disobedient. Jonah, I give you a divine commission. You are my prophet. And because of you, my prophet, Jonah probably liked to travel. He must have been the kind of person that liked to travel. You know, sometimes, man of God, our God, I don't, I don't like to travel. Well, God say, I'll let you be the local preacher. But there's some folk who just love to travel. They love to go places, love to meet new people. God will save them, give them a, an assignment. And next thing you know, you all over the place. You traveling here, traveling there, running. I'm talking to somebody, Brinson. I don't know why God got me traveling all over these places. Okay, come on now. If you wasn't doing ministry and you had the money, you would be all over the place anyway. So God said, I'm going to take your creative genius, who you are, and some of the things you like to do, some of your dreams, and I'm going to turn it over for me. And then some of the things you feel like you're weak in, I'm going to make them strong for you. And what you didn't like, I'm going to cause you to like them because I've given you assignments. You have to understand divine assignments, divine commandments. Your mission is directly related to your purpose, destiny. So I need you, Jonah. Well, get somebody else. I don't want to get nobody else. Well, how is it that we oh, we will have this dialogue with God to say, God, can you get somebody else? Some of us are more sensitive. We'll say, God, can you get somebody else? Some of us are trying to negotiate with God to get out of an assignment. And others just say, no, God, I ain't going to do that. No, no, no. No, 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 God, I, I just ain't going to do that. So Jonah was like, I'm just not going to do that. He didn't try to negotiate out of the assignment with his prophetic self. He just said he wasn't going to do that. Okay, so what happens? We have to begin to understand. First of all, he didn't want to do that because there were some issues around his assignment. Some of us, God has assigned us to do certain things and based upon the people, the situation, the geography or whatever, we have issues. We have issues and there's, you know, that's your reality. Jonah has some concerns about Nineveh, you know, the, 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 the capital of Assyria. And he has some concerns about um, how they treated people. You know, the Syrians, they were really vicious people. And when they would go into countries and stuff and take whole groups of people, children, women, uh, and, and other people, they would sometimes maim them, cut their arms off, and stuck, stick out their eyes and chip off part of their ears. Well, I mean, you look, you didn't came and destroyed my city, you tore up my family. Do you have to mutilate parts of my body? And so they were very vicious people. And, 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 and because of that, um, uh, Jonah had a, oh, he was just frustrated. Have you seen some people, they just vicious, violent, and you just have an issue with them because of their violence and their viciousness. Then God turns around after you having that issue and say, I want you to go minister to them. What? What? You, you want me to go over to that neighborhood? You want me to be bothered with that denomination of people? You want me to go with the, those group of people? Oh, no, 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 see, no, see, we already have, as the text say, we want to be what we call nationalistic or group. We want to be grouped in clannish and cliquish. So Jonah, he was nationalistic. He was like, I'm, we're from the children of Israel. We're special people. We're, we're God's special people. And so he's nationalistic. You have to be careful. Oh, uh, we, we're going to make America great again. Yes, sir, we're Americans. So nationalism, according to the commentary, said, the commentary said nationalism has a cousin. And nationalism's cousin is called exceptionalism. So I'm nationalistic. And in my nationalistic self, I'm exceptional. I make exceptions to people. So we go, So let's go back to the Trump re uh, regime. I'm nationalistic. We're going to make America great again. So you would think every American is going to be made great again and great. No, we're going to let us make America great again, but let us uh, exclude certain people in America. So nationalism has a cousin called uh, exceptionalism. We're going to exclude, except you, except you, the lower class, except you, certain ethnic groups, except you, certain people that believe certain things. This don't include you. 
And so you have to be careful when you become nationalistic or you become concerned and consumed and overwhelmed because some of your prejudice come out and you make exclusions to certain other people in your process. So now let's get back. That was just a sidebar. I just wanted to throw that out uh, because that was in the uh, commentary. Commentary talked about um, that. Um, it talks about that sometimes people that become nationalistic like Jonah. He was, you know, he thought God said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the Jewish community, you know. So now let's look at it. There's so much stuff in this text. I want to un un unpack this text. There's just so much historical data and other things in the text. But let me kind of switch over right now as and stay on this line that I'm all about ministry right through in here on the text as we look in the commentary. Jonah, the best known example of someone who blatantly Refuse God's call. God told him, go preach to a nation of people. Go to, go to a nation. He had issues with the nation. Uh, so, you know, um, John, you know, he just, you know, he just didn't want to do it. He just didn't want to do it. Now, let me say something for the comments. I'm going to read a couple of uh, uh, passages from the commentary from the Townsend Press, they said this, many men and women know the pressure of being called to ministry. Know the pressure. The absolute conviction of a personal call by God to the work of the ministry is the key that determines whether a person will remain faithful to the call. If you, if you don't understand you've been called to the ministry, there are certain assignments that God's going to give you. You're going to be like, no, no, you know, I ain't called to the ministry no more. What happened to you? Well, you know, I was in the ministry. What happened? I, well, I, you know, I don't know. I just don't know. There were certain things. I don't know. I just don't, didn't feel all of a sudden now you don't feel called. You know, some people can all of a sudden not feel called to the ministry after they get an assignment from God that don't go along with who they love. They don't, it doesn't go along with their palate. No, well, then I, you know, I, I must be hearing things. You know, maybe I went too soon. You know, maybe I need to get out of this. And so, therefore, if you are not absolute, if you don't have an absolute conviction of a personal call by God to the work of the ministry, then you will not be faithful. You, you, you won't be faithful. You'll be in and out, up and down, willy-nilly, in and out. So you've got to have an absolute conviction of a personal call by God to the work of the ministry. That's key. Because that's going to determine whether you fail or be faithful. Now, the conviction that God calls um, persons for his own purpose. You got to have that conviction, Brother Edward, that God calls you for his purpose. Your calling to the ministry ain't because you just decided to go. But your calling to the ministry is because God wants to use you for his purpose. God wants to use you as one of his ministers to implement his kingdom, thy kingdom come. So I need implement, implementers, those who will implement the kingdom and its varieties and its different divisions into the lives of people and to the community. So I'm going to use you as my servant. I'm going to give you the anointing and the get ability to do what you need to do. But I chose you. You didn't choose you. I chose you. Now, if you say, no, I, I, you know, as somebody say in the country, you, well, I saw a sign that say GP. You thought it meant go preach and it meant go plow. If you went, the you GP'd and went to preach when you're supposed to GP go plow, you messed up confused because when the times come, you're going to bag out. And so you have to understand that. You must have a conviction that God calls you for his own purpose. Paul, I called him. Ananias, no, God, you don't know. Paul is blind. He's praying. No, God, you don't know what he did. You don't know all the stuff he did in his background. No, 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 no. No, for he is called for me and I'm going to use him. I don't care what he did, where he is, what he used to do, how he killed the church. No, no, I have put him under divine arrest. I have a call on his life and I need to use you to go pray for the brother. Go pray. God needs you to be his coach. Go coach. No, God, I can't, you know, I just don't dis I just don't, I don't agree what he's into. I don't agree with his philosophy is. I, no, 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 no. I want you to go mentor him. Go mentor her. What, 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 how is that? 
How are you going to play the Jonah syndrome? Because you don't like something in the person. You don't like something in the nation. And God is giving you a word and assignment. And you're going to say, well, no, God, you don't, you don't understand. God said, no, no, I, I understand. Your gift, your talent, your ability, you are the one. You are, I'm talking to somebody today. I, woo, I'm talking to somebody. How dare you? God said, you are the one. What you would think you went through hell and sacrifice and situations and circumstances, all that was part of your cultivation process for your present call, your present situation. Your, your, I gave you a passion. You have a passion and a compassion for certain things. I've given you some sensitivity situations. I'm, I put you together for a time as this, and I need you to rise, go, preach, go teach, go counsel. Go coordinate, go coordinate, go administrate all of your life experiences. I mean, you well, look, 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 look. People that was intimidated by your presence, you had to go through hell to get what you are. You had to sacrifice some things in life. You don't think God allowed all that to come to be for him to call you at this point and you blatantly say you can't go when God said all those things that I will lead in, I will guide thee, and I have directed your life from, from the womb to now. I sanctified you and consecrated you in your mother's womb. And I've given you certain things for you to go to Nineveh. <laughs> uh, go to Nineveh, the great city. I didn't even send you to a little suburb town. I'm sending you to a big place. Now, the big place got a lot of issues, but I'm sending you to the big place. You're going to Nineveh. You're not going to uh, a little old town that nobody heard of. You're going to a big, you, I'm, I'm sending you. What happens when God want to send us some big place? The first thing that we that that magnifies in our mind is what we don't like about it, what we heard about it, and all the devilish stuff. I'm sending you Atlanta. You sending me to Atlanta? Uh, no. Why can't I go to Peru, Alaska? What? What's that? Nobody heard of. No, 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 no. I, I won't. No, no. I'm sending you to New York. I'm sending you to California. I'm sending you to San Diego. Well, why I gotta go there? How come you can't send me to a little small town? Because I'm just tired of the riff raffing. No, I'm going to send you where, I, where your gifts, talents, and graces best answers the need assignment of the Most High God. Isn't that something? God have need of you. God have need. He sends for you by his word. And you can't be, you got to stop. Stop running. Stop hiding. Stop not wanting to obey the divine commands. And so, because God's going to come back the second time. You can do all you want to do. God, God said you were a sign. You can't get away. So go ahead. Run. You know, like a like 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 a fisherman. You got the hook in them. If you hook them good, give them some line. Let them run. Let them run on in the water. But every now and then I pull up the hook and reel them in. Pull up the hook. Reel them in. Some of y'all God been pulling up the hook and reeling you in. And then when he gets you in close and get you at a place where you can hear him re good, it says, and then the word of the Lord comes to you the second time. And say, okay, you ran the first time. You went through some experiences. I took some things from you. Or I gave you some things to nimbus you. Now, are you ready now? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So here we go. So you have to understand you got to be faithful. So the conviction that God calls persons for his own purpose undergirds our work of teaching and preaching and evangelism and nurturing. And, 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 and life coaching, as well as the broader context of congregational and life in the church or parachurches or groups or not-for-profits or whatever. All believers are called to serve the, largest purchase, the larger purpose of God in the world. All believers. There's a larger purpose of God in the, in the earth outside the gospel of the world that he gave his only God son. Whosoever believing unto him, unto him uh, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a purpose. There's a purpose that all people be saved, but there's a larger purpose that I want you to live. I want you to have. I want you to subdue and plant and, and restructure life and societies. There's a larger work for you. And so you must be ready. Some of us at a certain part of time, God will send you to a great city, Nineveh. He'll send you to a Nineveh in your life. But you've got to be understanding that, yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm the believe God. But then but God said, now, are you ready for a greater work? There's a greater purpose of ministry. 
The kingdom of heaven is in all areas. So we've got ministry in the church, in the pulpit. We have ministry in the marketplace, in the boardrooms, on the bank, on the board banks of the, uh, Chicago, uh, the public libraries, the public schools, the private schools. I've got places in education. I've got places in community development. I've got places in economic development, political empowerment. I've got places in engineering and different other places I have that I need, that I want to send you to go certain of these places. And I want you. I want you, 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 I want. Huh? Can we say, speak, Lord, for our servant hear it? Huh? Oh, oh, well, that, Eli told Samuel that, well, sometimes God sends an Eli in our lives. That's questionable, but they know what to do and they know what to tell you. Huh? Well, I, I, I can't speak. I, my, well, my, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm in a bad situation. I'm a bad, I had a bad experience. I'm sinning. I'm into this and this. The people around me are sinful. Okay, well, I'm going to take some thongs. I'm going to take some tongues off the altar. I'm going to give you, I'm going to forgive your iniquity and your sins. If it takes me to blot out your iniquity and sins to get you going like Isaiah and Jeremiah, I will do that because I have given a divine mandate and a call for your life that you cannot get away with. And I will take care of certain things and work you over until you say yes. And when you say yes, I'll come back to you a second time. I'll be back. God says to some of y'all, I'm coming back to the second time. Some of y'all thought you got away. God said, no, you didn't get away. I just got you, let you run on the line. Boy, you didn't have some experience. God said, I'll be back for the second time. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Some of us, we do best to go the first time. You don't want to go the second time because you still going to have to go. After, but you the second time said you went through some experiences. So all believers are called to serve the larger purpose of God in the world, which is the expansion of, and spread of the gospel to the, all the reaches of the world in all places, in all ethnic groups. See, one of the critical aspects of our call to ministry is having an understanding of God's purpose in our lives. That's critical. you got to have a grasp and an understanding of God's purpose in your life in order to fulfill ministry. This was good. The commentary said that I'm reading from the commentary who said that. Uh, he says one of the critical aspects of our call to ministry is having a grasp of God's purpose for our lives. Very critical, very critical. The personal affirmation that God has called one to a noble work empowers them for the trials and triumphs of ministry. In ministry, you're going to have trials and triumphs. We have some good days, some bad days, some hills to climb. Oh, that's part of ministry. And people don't understand that. Yes, triumphs and trials. God has opened us a door. God, I got to come over to Macedonia. We have an open door, but there are many adversaries, many adversities, many. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, ooh, how did. Oh, glory. He opened the door. All right. Where it came adversaries and adversities, but you still got to stay in the door, go through the door. And meet all those past beyond the door, including your adversaries. Now, you must understand that. Without a deep conviction of the call of God, the work can become burdensome and disheartening to the point that many grow discouraged enough to quit the ministry completely. Because you're not clear of your purpose and your destiny is challenging enough. But if you're not clear that God is using you and wants to use you and you know he called you, you know you have purpose and destiny in him when the trials come and the frustrations come and all of the other things, the complexes of life come, you will leave. I, you know what? How many pastors and other leaders have walked away from ministry? How many? We even got pastors and leaders committed suicide. Left. Well, Brent and I fell from grace. So get up. Get back up. So you fell from grace. Where is that in the biblical text? Well, I, I don't. How, how can you fall from grace? Even in your fall, grace picks you back up. So there's no such thing as falling from grace. That's one of them evangelical elitist group statements where they fell from grace. Oh, so God is not. He, a, a righteous man fall it seven times. Get up. Get, get up. Get up. Arise. Get up. Told the children of Israel, rise and shine. 
There's nowhere in the scriptures where the children of Israel fell from grace. They was judged because of their fall. But if my people, uh, they, they had to go through some issues. They was in Babylon for 70 years, but they came out of there. They was in situations and circumstances, but God still said, you still my people. And those people who did you, I'm going to get them. He reproved kings, touch not my anointing, do my, okay. Those people who did you, they got to pay. Right? Because you, you still belong to God. God just used them to challenge you or to punish you or to wake you up. Now, they, they got to understand that they're just a, a servant. Don't, don't take it. Don't, don't keep on doing it now. God used you one or two times to check me out and get, put me in check. But don't think you're going to make a habit of that. You in trouble. You messing with the man of God, the woman of God. You just can't do what you want to do. Hey, that's it. So that's, that's, that's what we got to understand. So a lot of people, they became discouraged and quit the ministry completely. No one should come to the work of the ministry without a clear personal calling and an honest, thorough examination of the call. You know why? You got to have a thorough examination of the real challenges of church ministry. Some of us, we never had a thorough understanding of the challenges of church ministry, the challenges of the saints. We just, oh, I'm going to call the priest. Oh, I'm going to get me a little car. Oh, I'm having me a little members. Oh, I'm just, no, no, no. There's some real challenges when you say I'm going to be a part of the kingdom to implement the kingdom of God. There's challenges of ministry. Jonah had to understand that. You, Jonah, you my prophet. You in ministry, so you got to get up and go where I want you to go, regardless of how you feel or what you want to do. So you, no one should come to the call to ministry. People, huh? Without, have, have, let me say it again. People of all ages have announced a call to ministry without a careful, critical evaluation of the seriousness of their work. Failing to critically examine one's calling to ministry can result in thorough disillusionment with the many setbacks that often accompany such a demanding labor of love. Do you love me? Keep my, there's a demand. The demand of your labor caused a lot of circumstantial issues that you got to be ready for. Huh, Cheryl Crater, uh, Deanna Vale, did you understand that? You got to understand that often men and women enter the ministry field with high ambitions of greatness, high ambitions, and want to find out they are overwhelmed. So he says, the commentary, let me read what the commentary says about that. He said, often men and women enter the ministry filled with high ambitions of greatness or overwhelming optimism that they can change the world only to be met by the plethora of hardships, obstructionist church leaders, ap apathetic church members, obstacles and other challenges that leave many questioning the validity of their personal walk with God. What? 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 Brinson, what? 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 Let me read this again. Let me see. Let, if you don't do a critical analysis of what you're getting into, you're going to be met. Oh, you so excited. Oh, I got my license. Hallelujah. I got my ordination. I'm going over here. I'm going, oh, eh, 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 eh. Oh, you better sit down and talk to some people. You, get, you better get with some of the older persons. You better sit down and be mentored and you better pull in some people in your life and around you that can pray for you, that you can, that can coach you, that you can talk with as you do what we call ministry. See, Jonah needed some support partners. He didn't have, evidently he didn't have because he thought he could run from God and end up in the belly of the well. Some of y'all, y'all in the belly, belly right now because you didn't listen to nobody. You didn't have nowhere to talk to. You just thought you could have a little argument with God and go do your little tantrum. God said, I'm going to get you and he get you now. And he had you talk to certain other clergy or other people in ministry or either lay folks or others. You may not be where you are now because they would help you face the reality of ministry. So because you have gone into ministry with greatness of ambition, 
you had overwhelming optimism that God's going to work it out. You're going to build this church. You're going to build this church. And as soon as you took the church, only five people coming. You took the church and looked over the budget. You ain't got no money coming in. The roof is leaking now. The, the, the boiler went out. The air conditioning. I mean, you know, or people just ain't coming no more. The pandemic is up. You can't get no cooperate. Uh huh? Hey, let me read that. So what we got? You got in ministry, you have a plethora, a plethora of hardships. Obstructionist church leaders. You got people in the church, in the community, in the religion. They're obstructionists. Jesus he got up and read and said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And they was offended. There was people get offended on your announcement. Your announcement of what God's going to do. Your announcement of sharing your vision. They get offended. They want to kill. They try. They want. They, huh? they said they want to push Jesus over the cliff in his own hometown. His hometown folk want to kill him. Isn't this the prop, the carpenter's son? Isn't this brothers and sisters with you? You know, one of the most frustrating things is that God will use you. God will pull you out of your family. He'll pull you away from your parents or your family, take you through some issues that your family, your brothers and sisters, they didn't even go through. Send you through some trials and send you through some tests that your family ain't even qualified to do. You didn't pay the price. And then people will equal and equalize you to your family. Well, you know, he just like his brother. His brother ain't even, some of them ain't even saved. Well, his brother, his brother is, is got a little not-for-profit, but you got 5,000 members, so they equate you with your brother. The whole, they, I mean, you know, what you're trying to say, Prince, I ain't trying to say nothing. I'm saying that there are certain people in your family, they run off your anointing. They don't have none. They ain't accomplished nothing. They ain't did nothing. They can say, well, my brother this and they walk around because, because they have a brother or a father or a mother or a cousin that's in ministry and they want to front to other people, but they ain't got none themselves. They, they frustrating to you and people will put you on the same level with them. Isn't this the carpenter's son? They ain't been to no school. They didn't burn the midnight all that night. Half of them go to church and go to sleep with the preacher. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on now. Come on. Come on. Come on now. Come on now. I mean, people will do that. They will demote you equal to somebody else that ain't even thinking about ministry, that ain't even put nothing in. Oh, yeah. So that's part of the ministry. You know, Jesus, own brothers and sisters, they didn't follow him. His mother, maybe, but who is my brother? You know, you have to sometime. God, why come you just can't get together and be with your family? And sometimes God said, I want you to be Abraham, leave your family. Well, why you can't get along with your, that's your nephew. Uh, leave Lot. Let Lot go his way because Lot ran with you and got, got blessed because of you. Now his blessing is good. Now he's going to be bigger than you. And now he wants to, oh no. And then going to pick the best of the land that you brought him to. Oh, come on now. You all got to look at all this stuff that goes along with ministry and sacrifice. All that is in the, Brinson, how you and Pat, how that's in the Jonah situation? People say, I don't want to go for a reason. They don't want to go. They got personal issues and concerns about that. And so you have to do a critical examination because failing to critically examine your call to ministry can result in thorough disillusionment with many setbacks, you know, many, and people, so a lot of people, they become delusion. Oh, I thought you was in ministry. Oh, no, I ain't in no, ministry no more. What you doing? I'm in a business. Well, you actually, your business and what you're doing is still ministry, but you don't want to call it that because you've been hurt. I guess you call some of that church hurt. You, 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 well, I've been hurt by the church. Well, well, how you be hurt? That's part of the ministry. I'm hurt by the church. Well, how you be hurt? That's a part of being a, a disciple. Some things is just a part of life. And you can't be running around hurt and wounded unless you don't do a real understanding of people, of evil of situations, of circumstances. There's evil in the land. People are evil. The Bible says in Genesis, you know, man is evil from his youth. Young people, children, all this hijacking by teenagers, that's evil. Well, you know, the brain ain't fully developed till they're 24, 25, but they'll kill you with their brain not fully developed. They hijack your car and their brain ain't fully developed. It's developed enough to put you in harm's way. Come on now, come on, come on, come on now. You know, so Jonah was like, no, you know, 
man, no, uh, you don't send me to Nineveh. I can't be going to Nineveh. Now let's 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 segue now and go back to Nineveh. Let's let's deal with the Nineveh people. Now you know Nineveh was the headquarters or the royal city of the Assyrians. Now I told some of you all that you got to really go back and understand, you know, about people of color, blacks or people of color in the Bible. You know, people say, well, Brinson, you need to get a book on the black presence in the Bible. I say, no, no, I don't need to get a book on the Bible on, about the black presence in the Bible because the Bible is about black people, people of color. I need to find a book that says the, the white presence in the Bible. Dr. Carr, <laughs> one of my mamas in the ministry, Dr. Dr. Mary Child Carr. She was saying, somebody was asking, did you get Johnson's book on the black presence in the Bible? They kept harassing her. You need to get a book about the blacks in the Bible. You need to get a book that talks about all the black people in the Bible. And she said, finally, she got tired of the brother coming. She said, no, I don't need the book about blacks in the Bible, the black presence. But I need to find a book of the white presence in the Bible. Because people, all the characters in the Bible of this biblical text were people of color. So you got to know that. So the series with their black self. Now, they, they, the Nineveh. Now, let's look at it. Let's, let's do some historical unpacking now. The city of Nineveh was the headquarter royal city of the Syrians. Now, those of you that are Bible scholars, you know that the city of Nineveh was built by Nimrod. Nimrod was the son of Cush, which was the son of Ham. Now, no, 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 come on now. You know, so so now we want to be contradictive. Now, so white folks, you know, they used to tell us that you all black folks came from Ham and they cursed because they was black. They was cursed because they were black. So even if they tell us that, then when you go to the biblical text and read about the people that came from Ham, then they want to make them white. Now, come on, you can't have it both ways. So the great city of Nineveh was built by Nimrod. And Nimrod was the leader of the Tower of Babel, which was the son of Prophet Cush, which was the son of Ham. Now, wait a minute. Now, you got to go back because, see, people don't like to read the narratives. I like to go into the text. It says that Noah was saved, Noah and his sons. God not only spoke to Noah, it said when they came out off the ark that God said to Noah and his sons. God started communicating with Noah and his sons. Noah lived before his sons. So you telling me that Noah could talk to God, Noah experienced God, but Noah's wife, nor his sons and their wives experienced God? No, 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 no. If Noah could hear from God, and if Noah could talk from God, and Noah's family was saved through the ark, I, I, I promise you that Sham, Ham, and Japheth and their wives that were saved had an experience with God. And out of that experience, Ham had a son named Cush, and that's particular. He had more than one son, but Cush was one of his sons, which, according to the narratives and the historical documents, Cush was a prophet. Cush was over the worship. He was a prophet, a prophetic prophet. Not only was he a prophet, but he coordinated also the worship, and he also tied in with Jabel, uh, you know. With tubercle, you got to go back and read the study. Go back and study. And out of that, they came out Nimrod, which was, it says Nimrod was a mighty warrior before God. That did not mean, go back and study it. It did not mean that Nimrod was mighty, that God used him mightily. No. Nimrod was a mighty warrior in the eyes before God. Nimrod did what Nimrod wanted to do with God looking. Nimrod was a mighty warrior in the eyes, before the eyes of God, and God was looking down, and Nimrod was a mighty warrior, but Nimrod was the father of violence. So you got to go back and study. Nimrod was the, was the father of violence. So back in those days when earth was all with one, Nimrod began to move up in power and rule by the use of violence. That come out of Nimrod. Now some of y'all need to go and study that. All right, Professor Schaefer, help me out. Nimrod, the father, the father of violence. You know, some of the extra material says that Nimrod also went to Egypt and was responsible for building the pyramids under the help of the watchers. Uh, you, some of y'all need to read Enoch. But Nimrod 
was the father. He was a mighty man before God, meaning that he was a mighty in what he did in front of God's face. But he coordinated and began to get people to do what he wanted them to do by violence, manipulation, and control. So Nimrod built the city of Nineveh. All right. So now we got, we talk about people of color in Syria. And so the Syrians was known for their viciousness. They was known for their violence and their viciousness. They will come in and take, and take you over, take your land, take your people, take you, displace the people in the land, women and children, mess up the economic and political and sociological structures. And then they start mutilating. They will cut, you know, chop off part of your arm, cut a finger off. Gorge out one of your eyes or take both of your eyes out, cut your ear off, chop off your leg. They were vicious, vicious, violent people. And no, and, and Jonah knew that. And you're going to tell me to go to that city and preach to them. Because, see, I know if I go preach, I know my anointing. I know that I have anointing on my life. But if I walk in there and do some preaching, somebody going to change. So you got to be so confident of your gift, talents, and graces, that when God calls you to do something, you should celebrate because your experience with God says that there are certain changes that will occur when you walk into the room. So Jonah already knew. He already, he said, God, I know you. So you're going to send me to go 500 miles, 500 plus miles to this great city of Nineveh and preach to them that the city is going to be destroyed in 40 days. And because of my anointing, my gift, I'm going to have to have a revival. And I know if I run the revival in Nineveh, huh, we gonna, we, hey, them folk gonna change. And I, and I already know I, that's how you use me. I'm sorry. You send me to the worstest places to come out with the best of people. God got certain people that he sent to the worst of places to come out with the best of people. And you know that God can trust you to deliver his goods. You know how to work it. You know how to take five talents and make them 10. Take two talents and make them four. You're not the kind that hides your talent. And, and Jonah said, no, see, I, I'm going to go there. God said, you merciful. See, they are getting there and go to repent. When I get through preaching and singing and ministering, they, them folk going to repent. Huh? You ought to have that attitude. You, oh, y'all want me to come preach? Just smile. Uh-huh, because I, I know God going to use me today. I can trust in the fact I'm not, I'm not, propping myself up, but I can trust in the fact of my suffering and my commitment to God and his ministry and his anointing on my life, that if he's sending me over there, that's going to be some stuff. There's, I, God can trust me that I can sow some seeds and I can get some 60 and some 30, some 60, some 40, some 60 and some 100 fold ministry. God can trust me. Some of you all need to understand in your call that you need to feel and believe that when God send you someplace, he can trust you to produce a harvest. He can trust you to rearrange the such. He can trust you to change the political systems. He can trust you to reorganize how people think. Man of God, I've called you to pull down, to build, to tear, to restructure. He's uh, if I send you and you got a Nehemiah anointing, uh, you, hey, you will be able to take burnt stones and reconstruct a building. Nehemiah didn't come with no new stones. Don't y'all get me started. It said, Nehemiah, you're going to take the burnt stones out of the rubbish. You're going to take burnt stones out of rubbish and rebuild a wall. God said, I got, oh, I feel this thing. Somebody is anointed. Somebody is anointed right now that God said, I want to use you to take broken down people, wounded, hurt people, folks who are frustrated and restructure their lives and do some regenerification in their lives and use them in the marketplace of life for newness of glory. Who are you? Who are you? Why are you running from the presence of the Lord? God needs you to go to Jonah, the great, no, go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a great city. It was 60 miles long with the wide, 60 miles, 120,000 men in that city. Not only this, and not only included the cities around, the walls was 100 feet high. It said the walls were so wide that they could drive three chariots around it. Now, note, note, note this. Here's a black city, a city that was put together by a black man named Nimrod, who built and constructed the city of Nineveh that was so walled up that chariots could run across the top of the chariot. Now that sounds like another city, don't it? It sounds like Jericho, don't it? 
Jericho was just like that. It was walled up. Chariots could run around the wall. Them black folks in Jericho. You go to Jericho right now. Black folks live in Jericho. People call it. No, 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 no. You don't see no dark people. I've been to Jericho. People in Jericho look just like me. See me? See? This skin color? That's what's in Jericho. In Nazareth? Go to Nazareth right now. Go go to the Holy Land. Go to Jericho. I dare you to go to Jericho. You go down to Jericho, the folks look like they from Mississippi. Jericho. The people of Jericho build a wall. The chariots can run. Here Nimrod comes and builds Nineveh, a great city, a great city of trade and commerce. All kind of things going in that city. All kind of violence is happening in the city. All kind of commerce, the banks, all kind of things was going on in Nineveh. God said, but I need you, Jonah, to go to Nineveh. Where, where, where are my people that God is sending to Nineveh? The Ninevehs of our communities, the Ninevehs of America, the Ninevehs of the world. Where, where, where are you? Where, you are listening to me all over the world, all over the world, wherever you are. Where are the Nineveh cities? Where are the Nineveh cities, the great cities of the world? Identify the great cities of the world and what goes on in those great cities of the world. And then God's going to turn around and ask you, I want you to go and do a revival in the great city of the world. I want you to go with your anointing and your voice and your gift that will turn the people's hearts to me. And the, even the king, the president, the prime minister will hear your sermon. It takes six, it takes three days to get through Nineveh for all the Nineveh. But in the first day of people hearing your voice, revival going to strike. If God can use a Jonah to bring revival to a Nineveh of violence, he can use a Jonah or a Johanan, a Jonah to bring revival to New York, to Atlanta, to cities, towns and villages all across America, all across the, the African continent of Africa, the continents of Asia, all across the world in Europe, wherever my voice is being heard, down in Australia, God's got some Jonas that need to get up. You can't run no more. God is coming to you for the second time. Some of you all are in transient. Some of you all, God is restructuring. God wants you to be ready to hear the word. Well, you know, my time is up, man. I didn't even finish, man. I'm so true. I got some more stuff in here. There was so much stuff in this story. Uh, hopefully, I just said enough for you to 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 do. Amos, Amos said, God does nothing unless he revealed it first to the prophets. He wasn't going to do nothing for Nineveh until he sent the prophet Jonah there. God, can God change his mind? Yes, God can change his mind. Some of y'all all stuck off of the Trump situation. All them prophets prophesied that Trump was going to have two terms. Yeah, there were some people in the church that heard that. There were some people that saw how Trump started acting and got tired of that. And there was a group of people that started repenting and praying and changing and asking God to do something to get him out the White House. We'll repent. I don't know if they were still, you know, they, you know Nineveh was, was destroyed ultimately later. But some people turned. And so I'm saying, yeah, you know, God might have did tell him he had two terms. Yeah, but I can tell you what I know. I know there's a lot of people that re reassess that thing and start praying that God undo what he said. I know there's a lot of people that begin to pray and say, God, we got to get him out. Things got to change. There was enough people that could change God's mind that those prophets who prophesied and said, he, if they was a, if say they wasn't, they wasn't lying prophets. Say they were true prophets. You got to understand the prophetic nature of, of, of God. There, God, God is like this. He can say something and say, this is what's going to happen. But some of people can get together and pray and intercede to God and change from their way and God will heal the land. That's biblical. They'll get there and start praying. Oh, 40 days, never going to be destroyed. The king, they weren't even Christian believers. They were not Jewish. They, they heard the word of God and they believed God. They believed God, Linda. They believed God, uh, Apostle Patton. They believed God, Sister Dunlap. They believed God, Apostle Hardiman. And God, they, they were able to tilt the process. The God said, okay, I, this is what I was going to do. But uh, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull back. Because I got some people that will, call, that will stand in the gap and make up a hedge. 
Oh, you in your communities, will you stand in the gap and make up a hedge? In your ethnic group, the ethnicities of who you are, will you stand in the gap and make up the hedge? Do we have some people in India where the COVID is just killing up all the folks? So many people dying, they don't have room. They just have to set people on, set the bodies on fire. Is there some people that will stand in the gap and make up the hedge to turn, uh, to turn the pestilent assignment off the land? All this violence in the land. He said, I want you to go to Nineveh because of the violence in the community. Look in our communities. There's violence. There's violence. There's violence. Where are the Jonas? God is calling Jonas. God is calling symbolically. God is calling people to go to the great cities. To go to the great cities. Go to the great cities and proclaim judgment. Because I know if I can proclaim judgment, I can wake up some folk. That's going to hear my word and they're going to turn and they're going to repent and they're going to get rid of their evil ways. And then when they turn and repent and their works change, I can step in. God steps in when your works change, when you repent. You can say everything with your mouth all you want to. But when your works change and they repent it of their works and their works change, when you stop drive, having drive-bys, when you stop killing up folk, when you stop all that, Stop. Black lives matter. Okay. Then black lives matter. Then black people stop killing black people. If black lives matter, then black people, we need to start and be the first representatives of our truth. Black lives matter. Black folks get along with black folks. Start setting up works. We're going to be in our communities. We're going to protect our communities. We're going to work with our communities. We're going to stand in the gap for our people. And once we start doing that, the, the enemy can't come in because we have a touch and agree that there's going to be peace in our communities, that our young teenagers ain't going to be hijacking people, that our young black men going to put their pants up. Come on, somebody. We got to change our works. Well, I'm praying that God deliver us. Deliver what? The heart got to change. It says when the people change and their works, then God changed. Faith without works is dead. So y'all done got me going now. <laughs> y'all done got me preaching. I was talking to talk about Jonah. Now I want you all that are, that are listening to me. I know I've said enough. I've got, you know, I, I, you know, one of the things I'm grateful for, all of these scholars that tie into my show. The only thing I need to do is get you going. I just need to get you thinking. I, I I just need to get you motivated and stimulated. You all can take the story of Jonah. and You can go in there and start dealing with Jonah's personality. You can deal with the people. You can deal with change. You can deal with ministry. We, you can deal with understanding ministry. You can deal with God showing the prophet, God using the prophetic nature to change people. You can. There's a lot of motifs in this story that you can look at. So I hope that you can take those things that we brought to you today, all of you that that's that that watch me every Wednesday. We're on every Wednesday from two to three. Every Wednesday, hit your share button. Every Wednesday, a uh, Doctor uh, Sylvester Paul Brinson on the Brinson Connection, Governor Apostle of Outreach Ministries and 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 the Apostolic Company Empowerment Network. Amen. And uh, every Wednesday from two to three. But go on YouTube. Go to my channel YouTube and subscribe. Doctor Sylvester Paul Brinson the third. That's three capital I's. Put me in. Put my name in the search bar. And pull up my channel. We've got over 150 teachings. Get them. Get them. Read them. Look at them. You know, then go to my timeline. I, I, I keep stuff on my timeline. Push share button. Send the stuff out. We continue to be faithful. All of my brothers and sisters over the world, all over the world, I'm confident that God has a way to use you. All the things that we see in our world and our society, the question is, will you be the prophet? Will you be the man of God, the woman of God? Will you be the sons and daughters? In the last days, I pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your handmaids and your maidservants shall prophesy. So there's no such thing as a bond nor free. Uh, there's no such thing as old and young. I pour out my spirit. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dreams. Visions and dreams together creates legacy. And the reason why we don't have a legacy is we don't have the energy of a vision marinating with the experiences of a dream. Dreams and visions have to work together to create legacy. We got to stop dying without legacy. We got to stop dying without passing the torch. We got to stop dying with holding on to the torch. 
We got to mentor and train our sons and daughters. And we got to sensitize our sons and daughters as we become sensitized to our sons and daughters issues. All this stuff of the millennials of this and the millennials that. No, listen to the millennials. As you sensitize, as you want to teach and train your youth, your children, your grandchildren, you got to become open and understand to hear what they got to say. I will, in the last days, I will turn the hearts of the fathers into the children and the children to the fathers. So it's a two-way street. Not only have you got something to say to the millennials and others and the Gen Xs and the, and the Gen Zers now, 23 uh, to 12, you, you got some, you should be able to talk to seven generations. Look at you. Look at what age you are. There are seven alive generations on the planet. The question is, you as a believer, can you communicate to the seven generations? That include your generation plus six others. If you don't, then you need to study. You need to retool. You need to format. Not throw away what you have, but add to it. Until next time, this has been your host, Apostle Dr. Sylvester Paul Brinson III, the Dean of the Brinson Connection. And may God bless you is my prayer.